There we go. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, big shout out to, for tonight, um, the Ann Arbor District Library for helping us. We partnered with them all year. So each of these events were designed anyway to be hybrid. In January and February, we had some freak events that uh, brought some weather where we couldn't be in person, but we are, are happy to be here on this beautiful night. Thank you for coming out. Um, and then, let's see here. So to present um, on tonight, we have um, some really great panelists here. I'm excited to have Jan Culbertson and Missy Stoltz and Julie Roth, and I will introduce them each um, when they come up to speak. Um, but before we get into them, I would be remiss if we made it through tonight without mentioning that next week is A20 week. So A20 week is an annual uh, commemoration of the council adoption of the A20 plan of Ann Arbor's plan for a just transition to carbon neutrality. And so at the first full week of every June, we celebrate um, um, all of the work that we've made over the previous year. Uh, we bring together our collaborators uh, who are doing a lot of really great work around the city. And we have events June 4th all the way through June 10th. Um, so you can scan this QR code or find more on the website at a2gov.org slash a20week. You can volunteer if you are interested in helping out with some of these events. Um, many of these events are put on by A20 collaborators. These are organizations and um, businesses throughout Ann Arbor and the area who are helping the city achieve this goal through the work that they do. Um, and so because they're putting on, they're hosting um, and attending most of these events, this is a great opportunity for you to get um, in-person interaction with a lot of the collaborators and OSI staff will be at a lot of these events, almost every event as well. So um, come on out, we'd love to see ya. Um, and um, just briefly before I introduce Jan, uh, we, like Tyler said, we'll go through the presentations, we'll do some Q&A at the end, um, and so please write down your questions as, the, as you think of them so that we can be sure to get to them at the end. Um, and you, again, you can always find the recording of this on our website. CTN hosts a sustainability channel where all of these recordings are hosted. Um, so without further ado, I am going to present Chan Culbertson. Um, my screen is fully being shared, isn't it? So can I, how do I do this where, I'm used to having two screens at home. So when I try to, oh, Tyler, we're share, you were on your view, right? Last month I was able to share this, okay. Then it's going to go with this view. So we see that. Let's see. We didn't have this last week. But you also see that. Hmm. Well, we haven't encountered this before. So I want to share just my slides, but, um, and then change my screen. And I'm not sure how to do that. Sorry, folks. We are excited that this is a hybrid event. Um, so when I look at something else here, is that what's being broadcast? That's not what, not what it's being yeah, shared, is this it? Is what, uh, this is what people are seeing on Zoom. Should be, yeah. Okay. But what I can do. Oops, I don't know. This can. Okay. I tell you what, it's not a big deal because people are going to hear me say what I'm about to share. 
So uh, they can see it too. That'll be fine. Thanks, Tyler. All right, so I'm going to introduce Jan Culbertson, who is a senior partner with the local architecture firm A3C. She's a member of the Ann Arbor Public School Sustainability Advisory Committee. Jan is also active in Sile Township, serving as the vice chair of the Sile Township Zoning Board of Appeals and as a member of the Sile Township Planning Commission, as well as state level advocacy as co-chair <laughs> of AIA Michigan's Government Advocacy Committee. Um, so while Jan wears many hats, she will be joining us as the leadership chair of the Ann Arbor 2030 district tonight. This organization uses collaboration, incentives, and shared resources to lead a private sector effort to prove a business case for sustainability. Jan's many skills include lead specialization, sustainable design and building decarbonization, master planning, and renewable energy. Um, and on top of all of that, in her free time, she enjoys the Huron River as a member of the Barton Boat Club and especially enjoys hiking and biking. So um, please join me in welcoming Jan Culbertson. Where do I go for my slides? Let's go to oops, next. Oh, I started off. There, there we go. go. All right. So thank you, Zach, for that long intro. <laughs> Really, uh, I'm doing what I love right now. I actually retired from A3C, so I can do, like, uh, you know, accelerating to zero full time. So I'm I'm really happy to do that. So a little bit of a background about the Ann Arbor 2030 district. Um, it was started in 2018. Whoa! I think this is on a timer. Um, I'm going to be hitting back a lot. Um, so. Uh, we're a part of a network of 2030 districts across uh, North America, and we're one of 24, and we get together and share the strategies and the programs and funding um, to uh, accelerate to zero, basically, all over the country and in Victoria and uh, Toronto. Um, the membership of the Ann Arbor 2030 district is actually comprised of three different types of members. We have our property owners, managers, and that also includes tenants. Um, we have professional service providers and community organizations that are all interested in uh, accelerate, accelerating to zero. And right now we have uh, about 330 buildings um, and um, about 13 million square feet. And what that means is all of these, the majority of these buildings are in Energy Star Portfolio Manager. They are benchmarking their energy use and many of them their water use. Um, and then we also do a transportation survey. And the goal is we have give every building a baseline. We give them uh, an energy efficiency target. And uh, ultimately, we're, we're looking toward uh, net zero carbon buildings. So eliminating all greenhouse gas emissions. The, one of the things that we're doing in 2023 is a partnering also with Resilient Washtenaw. So if there are any, there's anyone listening whose building is not in the city of Ann Arbor, um, we, we accept anyone who's willing to um, track their uh, emissions and track their energy and water use and work with us um, to meet also the Resilient Washtenaw goals. So um, we are doing a research uh, teaming with um, the CS team, and they are reaching out to all the cities, villages, and townships. So just like Ann Arbor is benchmarking their municipal operations, everyone throughout the, the county can also benchmark their municipal operations. And we're doing that with CS, and then we have a Graham Sustainability Scholars Program that we also partner with to help with our transportation survey, and they are also working on um, outreach over the summer. So it's great to have U of M as a partner because we can get a whole lot more done with them. And it's great working with the students. Um, so, what, so what are the programs that we do? Uh, we partner with um, the city of Ann Arbor to provide people with benchmarking assistance. There is an ordinance that um, ultimately by next year, every building, commercial or multifamily building that is uh, on a parcel and totals 20,000 square feet or above will need to benchmark. And so that's a lot of buildings in Ann Arbor. And so we provide free benchmarking assistance. Um, we just launched with um, 
in collaboration with A20, a commercial kind of, uh, it's really a commercial, I can't say solarized, I have to say solar, a commercial solar program. And uh, that's open to any commercial building or, uh, in Washtenaw County. And we provide technical assistance um, for that, which includes we have a, um, an RFP if you know a lot about solar or you have a professional that is assisting you, you can download the RFP and use that or we'll walk you through um, the process of feasibility, um, uh, kind of going through that request for a proposal, reviewing your bids with you, and also reviewing your final, um, uh, your bills, and making sure that the um, uh, our DTE is billing appropriately, because we found a lot of issues with the billing sometimes. So um, that's a new program, and we just uh, actually last Friday, our first pilot in Sio Township uh, connected to the grid. Woohoo! So, and I think I haven't heard from the Humane Society, but I think they they must be close behind in, in hooking up theirs. So it's it's about an uh, so far we've implemented probably the equivalent of maybe ten to twelve households of solar just with the two pilots. So. We're hoping that that will really accelerate renewables in Ann Arbor. Um, the other thing that we do in association with A20 is um, provide and uh, email our stakeholders. Um, so for instance, we're trying to get some ideas from building owners on how uh, we might want to do the rebate design for the millages for commercial and multifamily properties. So. Um, we let people know, and hopefully um, a lot of our members will provide input either through the survey or for the in-person meetings. So it's a real collaboration of getting the word out and uh, working closely, actually one-on-one -on -one with, with people. Uh, we have uh, two kind of member groups. One is House of Worship. And there are multiple programs that the House of Worship folks do. It's a bunch of green team people getting together. So you can imagine that has a lot of momentum and encouragement for folks. Um, and then our multifamily group is really focused on supporting people um, as the Green Rental Housing Ordinance um, rolls out so that uh, everyone says, oh, I understand why we're doing this. And you know what? We can help you comply. So. That's, uh, those are the two kind of uh, best practice groups, if you will. Um, the other thing we do is we do um, a Lunch and Learn series, and all of those are recorded on, on our website. It's, uh, this is the, actually the third year. And, 619. Oh, <laughs> 619. Um, and in, as a part of that, um, we explore the technologies. Um, our next one, which is, um, uh, June 12th is going to look at both legislation that's coming out um, in the state and uh, some of the buildings locally that are working to achieve that net zero carbon. Um, we did have a task force that came out of that that um, em developed a low embodied concrete um, and that there's a white paper on our, our um, uh, website and we actually went all the way through to MDOT to make sure that the MDOT specifications um, could accommodate the slow embodied carbon. All right, then getting to the how do we get things done, um, we have an energy management grant program. Any building that becomes a member is automatically eligible for funding for energy management, and people have used it in different ways. Um, we have the ASHRAE Level 2 audits, which provide really detailed information for that energy efficiency. That's sort of the first step in zero net carbon buildings, right? You want to make sure you're operating efficiently. And then there's the, um, we do some commissioning for building systems that kind of goes along with that efficiency. And then we've started to do um, fund some decarbonization um, plans uh, as well. So really helping people support people where they are with their buildings and how to get to that zero net carbon. And our grant program totals 85,000 for 2023. Um, we're gonna do, yay, our first <laughs> celebration of actually getting things done. And that's gonna be June 28th and um, we're gonna kick it off with a series of um, workshops that people can participate in and then do some networking. And we have uh, Pecha Kucha, those are 
20 slides in 20 seconds, um, presentations of how uh, different buildings and different organizations are reaching um, zero net carbon. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you, Jan. All right. Next up is Missy Stoltz, who is the Director of Operations in Ann Arbor's Office of Sustainability and Innovations. Missy works with all city operations, residents, businesses, the University of Michigan, nonprofits, and others to make Ann Arbor one of the most sustainable and equitable cities in America. Prior to joining the city, Missy worked with local governments and indigenous communities around the nation to advance their climate and sustainability goals, including during her time as the climate director at ICLE, of Local Governments for Sustainability, as, and as a consultant to philanthropic organizations. I think that we could probably go on for days and days about Missy's experience, but I am eager to see her presentation, as I'm sure you are too. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Missy Stoltz. Thanks, Thanks everybody for coming out. I don't know, did anyone else uh, have a little shock with that heat as you stepped outside? You're like, I want this, but not this quick, because that's sort of how I felt. Well, thank you for taking some time to join us in this nice, clean, clear, cool room. I'm gonna talk just very briefly give you some highlights about A20. I'm gonna assume you're here because you know about A20, and I know many of you in this room, so I know you know about A20. Then I wanna talk about what's on the horizon and ways to engage in the movement, because what really matters is what we do next, right? We, we celebrate where we've come, where we are in this moment, and we need to really focus on where we go from here. So with that, this is gonna be fast. Uh, just heads up, don't worry, we have the recordings posted so you can jump back in at any point. So let's just ground ourselves, A20. This is our community's plan, framework, goal, actions, everything, the brand, for how we are gonna achieve a just transition to community-wide carbon neutrality by the year 2030. Yep, 2030, right? That's what we are running, running at every single day with our wonderful collaborators and partners. Now, I wanna kind of give you some highlights of what we've been able to achieve in the three years since we were created. And we're not quite three years old. Technically, tomorrow is our three-year birthday, which is very exciting. Uh, but here are some of the things. I'm not gonna read all of these. We've been able to install over four megawatts or have under contract four megawatts of solar at city facilities. We also have moved four megawatts of solar forward through our Solar Rise program, which is helping residential, stake, residential uh, homes embrace solar that Julie runs, and she can talk more about that. We've launched the commercial solar program, which you heard Jan mention. We're exploring pathways to fund uh, our entire community with transitioning to 100% renewable energy, whether that be through a sustainable energy utility, a municipal electric utility, a virtual power purchase agreement, or another mechanism. But we're doing an energy options analysis right now to understand those different different pathways and how they align with our goals and our values in the community. We're working on what would be the nation's largest landfill solar project, if we can get it off the ground, 20 megawatts, uh, that also has a community solar element to it, which is really novel. In Michigan, you cannot do community solar without a collaboration with your utilities. We are simultaneously uh, going to be starting a geothermal, uh, district geothermal program, because we won a grant a few weeks ago from the US Department of Energy to figure out how we could power 262 homes, a local school, a county mental health facility, and our own public works facility with geothermal. So there's a whole bunch that's happening in here. Um, and delighted to share that a few weeks ago, we also won $2.5 million from the federal government to advance more solar on city facilities. So we are running at renewable energy. This is just a little bit of what we got going on there. Strategy two of A20 is around beneficial electrification. Some highlights to share here. We've worked on kind of this whole home assessment. It's a kind of path to zero, A20 assessment uh, that helps homes figure out how they themselves can get to zero carbon emissions. What energy efficiency things can they do? What on-site renewable energy potential do they have? How can they improve indoor air quality? What opportunities do they have to electrify? And we're piloting that right now through an energy advisory service so we can make sure that it works across different demographics, different spectrums, different neighborhoods, different types of houses. And the goal is that we'll be launching that soon, which you'll see in a minute. We're deploying charging infrastructure throughout the community to embrace uh, vehicle electrification that's happening. We learned a few weeks ago Ann Arbor has the highest EV adoption rate in the state. 
That's probably not surprising if you kind of look out on the streets. We need to make sure we have the infrastructure to support that, and we need to make sure that we do that as equitably as we can. What about our multifamily dwellers? Right? If you're in an apartment complex, where do you charge? How do, we, how do we address that? So that's one of the initiatives we're working on right now with various uh, different property owners in the community. And we have to transition our own fleet. So the city's fleet is over 20% in the light duty vehicle that we've transitioned. As vehicles come up for replacement, the first assumption is they're going electric. If we can't get an electric, for example, in heavy trucks, there are certain things that aren't quite yet available. And then we talk about leasing or what time frame. So we make sure that we are leading. I'm delighted to share we have a street electric street, street sweeper that's in operation right now. We have an electric bucket truck we're working on, and we have two electric refuse trucks that we've ordered. Uh, but they're not here yet due to supply chain challenges. But when they are, we will invite you all out to check out those trucks because they're very, very cool and impressive. Our third strategy is around energy waste reduction. It's smart, right? You, the best energy is the energy you don't have to use. And here we have a lot of various initiatives underway. Everything from our energy and water benchmarking ordinance that Jan mentioned will move to buildings 20,000 square feet and up. But this is giving us really great data and opportunities for how we can strategically work with our property owners to make interventions that save them money, improve air quality and quality of life, and oh, by the way, happen to save them some money on their uh, energy bills. We're working on a rental efficiency ordinance. We're working on a home energy rating disclosure ordinance, and those are going to be moving forward here shortly. I mentioned we're piloting this energy advisory service, which effectively is like a bat phone that you can call when you need help. What do you do, right? This is overwhelming. There are so many things you can do in your home. How do you get assistance to make a customized decision that's right for me and my family versus what Zach needs and his family needs in their home? And so we want to provide that customized support to make this really, really easy for folks to move through the landscape. We're also doing this at city buildings. Uh, we're working in the Bryant neighborhood. We have a goal of making that the nation's first carbon neutral existing neighborhood. And the Bryant Community Center uh, is actually a resilience hub. We'll have a ribbon cutting next Friday if you'd like to come and see that facility and understand what that means. But we are also using federal funding to make that a carbon negative building and a demonstration site for what all of these technologies look like. Right? So you can touch them, you can interact with them. We want to demystify what this means in your own home. And there's some other initiatives kind of listed here that we're working on too. Our fourth strategy is about the circular economy, really changing our relationship with stuff and thinking about how we have much more relational interactions with the people uh, that are providing the services or the resources that we use. So some examples of the things we have underway, we have a returnable container program that we've been piloting with four local businesses. Last week we had a series of workshops and we're looking to expand that to every restaurant in Ann Arbor where there is no more styrofoam. You just get this returnable container that you take and you drop off when you go back to any restaurant or when you're out kind of walking a dog or a child, uh, you can drop off those returnable containers. We've also moved to around composting, including Saturday pickup, which is really important in the downtown, especially during like football uh, weekends, art fair. You can imagine a lot of stuff gets uh, starts to accumulate. We've done plant-based challenges. These are week-long challenges where we help people by actually providing them plant-based recipes and food and guiding them through trying different things. Like Cottage Inn has a vegan pizza. It's delicious if you guys have not had it. I am a huge fan. But did you, most of us didn't even know that, right? So how do we highlight plant-forward diets, kind of demystify uh, that they all taste the same or there's not much protein in those diets? So we want to help bring people in uh, to the, the plant forward movement. We do the same thing with zero waste challenges. It is overwhelming figuring out how to reduce the amount of stuff that we consume. And so we help people through cheeky little contests, through educational tips, uh, where we give tips and tricks to help you reduce the amount of waste that you generate by shopping at local businesses that pr promote the circular economy. And then we're working on things like a carbon labeling system. So when you go into restaurants, uh, we have someone in the room who worked on this, that uh, you could actually see the carbon footprint associated with the food that you're purchasing. So El Harissa has this right now on their menu. If you go in and you wanna order some delicious food, you can actually make a decision based on a red light, yellow light, or green light, which is associated with the greenhouse gas emissions of that food. Right. So again, it may not matter, but it may. And it may encourage people to make a behavior change. And so we want to make this really, really easy for people uh, to start embracing the A20 actions. Our fifth strategy is about resilience. <clears throat> Here are just some highlights I'll share. 
we're working. We have a goal of 10,000 trees planted in the community that actually survive. We have 6,000 that have gone out the door. <clears throat> we're working on the remainder right now. We'll get them out in the next fiscal year, as you'll see in a minute. We do free tree plantings. We just purchased some trees for some free tree plantings today. We've got air quality monitors up, so we understand the health implications of existing operations, as well as how effective are our interventions? Are they actually improving air quality? And if not, how do we make adjustments? That's an important variable for us. We have our first two resilience hub, Northside Community Center and Bryant Community Center. We're working on our next two. We're uh, working to distribute emergency preparedness kits and work on plans because we know that's a really important variable. We've got to be prepared for all of the impacts that are coming our way. And then uh, today is the last day. What was no formerly known as No Mow May is now the Pollinator Aware Yard Care Program because it's not just about No Mow. May. It's about how we grow native species all year long and how we care for our natural environment in whatever way we can. And so this is a much more comprehensive initiative that I encourage you to find out more about on our website. You can even get a yard sign from us uh, and uh, once again tips and tricks on how you can support a more pollinator friendly yard. And then just to kind of round out our last few strategies, some things I'll, I'll highlight that we've got going on. We are working on an update to our comprehensive land use plan and the two variables that guided the selection of contractors and that will guide the implementation of that plan are equity and carbon neutrality. That's really exciting. And that's a fundamental shift in how we've thought about land use in the community. So we're gonna be uh, kicking off a bunch of support in that space. Uh, we're supporting a, the expansion of bike lanes. We give out grants because there is no universe in which we can do this by ourselves. And there is no universe in which we have all the great ideas. So if you've got an idea that you wish had been implemented, please consider applying for a Sustaining Ann Arbor Together grant. You can get up to $10,000 to do something in the public space to advance sustainability. Maybe your neighborhood needs something. Well, come talk to us. It's a pretty low barrier to get involved. And then we've got an A20 Collaborators Network. It's over 120 organizations. There are many of uh, the entities we'll be working with next, next week at A20 Week. But this is a way that we work and highlight the wonderful practices of the existing organizations that we have here and their alignment with our carbon neutrality uh, efforts broadly. I would be remiss if I didn't say in November, uh, the voters, all of you, uh, went to the ballot box and with 71% of the vote, we became the eighth community in America to tax ourselves to fund climate. That is extraordinary, if you think about it. So uh, I use this as sort of a pivot to where I'm gonna go in the future. Now this uh, funding becomes available July 1st. So we don't have it yet. If you're really excited to get these dollars out the door, I promise we're working really hard to get ready for it. We just don't have them quite yet. It's 20 years. It's estimated that it'll generate roughly $7 million a year for A20 activities. And the funding mirrors A20, renewable energy, uh, circular economy work, resilience work. That's all part of what we're trying to move forward. So with that, let me tell you what's on the horizon and then I will wrap up. Everything I just said is still gonna continue. Okay, so that's like base one. And we're gonna continue uh, doing utility interventions. We work with the Michigan Public Service Commission. We challenge rate cases that come out from our various utilities. We work on renewable energy standards. Uh, we work on promoting more renewable energy adoption. That's a not insignificant part of what our office does to make sure we set up an ecosystem that allows us to be successful. We also wanna support and see the state thrive. The state has adopted the My Healthy Climate Plan and we wanna support them in getting that plan moved forward and implemented because it will just reinforce our work locally and help the work we're doing expand throughout the region. We also wanna see in the next year at least one more megawatt of solar on city facilities, two more megawatts through that solar program. I'd like to see, uh, you know, let's go, let's go two, I'm just making it up on the spot. Commercial solar, uh, we're gonna get two megawatts through commercial solar, so sign up if you would like to have solar on your building. We also wanna get 100 more chargers in the community with a focus on apartment complexes. We really wanna tackle this challenging kind of split incentive uh, issue that we're facing. We are uh, just about to launch our fourth cohort of A20 ambassadors. So as an individual, if you are really excited about A20 and you wanna come with us on this journey, please consider applying. 
uh, we love this. The application is gonna open June 4th. So you can go to our website, you can learn more and get ready for that application process. We've got a lot of work on sustainable food. We're working on a policy and various initiatives with folks like Kathy Sample from Argus to figure out how we can kind of broaden the ecosystem and really hold space for the sustainable food uh, network that we have in our community. And we want uh, 4,000 more trees in the ground. And I'll just point out those last two, if we get that done, that completes an A20 action. Those are two actions in our plan that would be done next year. <gasps> but that's not all because there's more we're gonna do. Uh, we are gonna get that green rental housing and that herd policy over the finish line. We're gonna install more air quality monitors and when we do that, we will complete that A20 action uh, that's in our plan. We're launching the energy advisor next year. Once again, another A20 action we're gonna get done. Uh, we are working on a circular economy engagement strategy right now, which will launch next year. So join us at some events. Help us figure out what does it mean to create a circular economy here in Ann Arbor. We're gonna keep pushing to create America's first carbon neutral existing neighborhood in Bryan. Game on. Uh, we are writing lots of proposals and grants. We work closely with the residents, with Community Action Network. Uh, we will continue that focus because it's demonstrative of what's possible. And it's really, really important for our work broadly. There's some other things listed here. I'll just note, uh, we did also win a grant to help transition all of our street lights to LEDs. That goes into effect July 1, so we're gonna start doing that. Another A20 action. Uh, and on Monday, we're gonna launch the community engagement with local businesses around a green business challenge in partnership with Spark. And we're looking to actually provide funding to help our businesses, uh, just like the 2030 does, kind of stack more support on top so businesses can move forward with the decarbonization that we need to see. But that's not all. Uh, we're gonna expand our Aging in Place Efficiently program because we need to help our low income, uh, older adults stay in our community. And we know that there are challenges as Michigan ages to folks staying in place. And so we've got an initiative, we've helped 17 homeowners uh, navigate aging in place efficiently. We are fundraising to help many, many more uh, stay because that's the richness that we have in our community, our people, and we need to invest in our people. We've got the Inflation Reduction Act coming. Chances are we're not gonna see rebates. I just heard until 2024. Uh, not great news, but news. So we are staying on top of that so we can push that information out to residents so you can get the incentives as soon as possible uh, as they're available. A few last things I'll point out. Uh, we are gonna push and pull and scream until we get this landfill solar project over the finish line, which will be another A20 action. And when it goes, it will have community solar, which is another A20 action, so very exciting. Uh, we're gonna get 100 ambassadors engaged. We're at 75 right now, so join us. Please help us get that number. You can see another action there. Uh, and then we're gonna continue uh, to expand the benchmarking ordinance to hit that threshold of the 20,000 or above, which is what comes into effect next year. And that will also complete another A20 action. So I'm gonna close and just share some of the things that are kind of more relevant to, to you all from the millage and then ways to engage. So some things I wanna highlight, the seven million that comes in is a lot of resources that's gonna help us expand A20. But I also wanna be transparent that when we created A20, we modeled what it would cost to implement it. And the, actu the, the answer to that was $1 billion. So having 20 years at seven million is great. But you heard me talk about fundraising because a lot of the money that we're getting from the village, we are leveraging to then go to philanthropy and to the federal government and say, we need more to do more, right? So that's one of the uses from the millage. The largest bucket from the millage, however, are direct rebates back to residents. So we are in the process of designing those right now to help get money back in your pocket to do things like energy efficiency, upgrade your electrical panel, so it can handle the amount of electrification that's coming. Uh, embrace renewable energy. What if we actually had an EV discount that was a local program that you could get if you embraced an electric vehicle? So we're creating those types of programs. Direct rebates will be a continual uh, initiative that we offer through the millage. The, it says concierge, but this is the energy advisory service. That's being funded through uh, the millage that comes. We obviously have to scale up the amount of staff. We're doing a lot of things in our office and we are tiny. We have to have people that can hold this work and make sure it's effective. So if you're looking for employment opportunities, please check our website in the next several weeks. There will be many uh, that come forward. We are expanding walking and bike infrastructure. 
We're making the infrastructure investments to get to year-round composting and recycling for multifamily and commercial sites. Uh, we are working with the Housing Commission to make sure our housing, our affordable housing is net zero energy. That makes sense. They can save money uh, in terms of their operational costs. That money can be reinvested in more housing or it can be invested in more services for tenants at those sites. So this is really important to us. Then we are, uh, if I had to pick a word, I would say the word of the year has been circularity. We are going to just double down in our work on the circular economy because it is just so vibrant. So with that, let me just say, share kind of closing here. If you're excited and you want to get involved, there's many different ways. A light touch, join our listserv. And we send out monthly notes and then notices when things are timely. Just stay abreast of what's happening in the office. Maybe you have no capacity right now to volunteer, but maybe in six months you might Right? And that, this is one easy way to find out about the work that's happening in the office. Or maybe you're really excited and you want to tell your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Well, contact us. Let's host an event together. And let's talk about ways that we can engage collaboratively in this space. Share your feedback with us. Regularly, we ask for the public's ideas about different initiatives. Right now, we have one open on a sustainable heating franchise. What does it mean to sustainably heat our community? And we're asking for public comment. Become an A20 ambassador. Apply for one of those positions that we have open. We'd love to work with you. You could become an A20 collaborator if you happen to work with or represent an organization. Come deeper into the movement and help us implement solutions that'll get us to carbon neutrality. If you're really glutton for punishment, join us on a board or a commission. I'm just kidding, they're great. Uh, we would love to have you. Our office oversees the Energy Commission and the Environmental Commission. Uh, come on in to that work. There are advisory commissions to city council, so you don't work as closely with staff, uh, but it is a space where you can, you can kind of engage more in democracy and action. And then, of course, if you've got a great idea, apply for one of these grants. Right? We have $100,000 bucketed every year that we give out in these grants, and I can tell you that we have a little bit left right now uh, that I need to spend in the next few weeks. So if you've got a great idea, get an application in. And then lastly, stay up to date. Check out our website, uh, constantly going through revisions. There's a lot more information about the work that we're doing, ways you can engage, educational tips and tricks, uh, but most importantly, just get involved, whatever that looks like for you. Because together, I think the future really does look bright, but the only way that it's gonna look as glorious as I think it is, is if we all become part of the movement. So thanks so much for your time tonight. But wait, there's more. Um, awesome, thank you so much, Missy. Um, and uh, Julie, yeah. you're going to follow that? No. Oh, no. all right. <laughs> well, um, great. Well, I'm, I'm happy to present Julie now, who is a senior analyst in the Office of Sustainability. Um, her work focuses on the creation, the implementation, and management of programs to facilitate community-wide adoption of solar, building electrification and efficiency. Julie has a BA in biology from Kenyon College and an MPT from the University of Iowa. She's lived in Ann Arbor since 1994 and is a passionate green energy advocate, community organizer, educator, and liaison between the technical sector and the community. So please say welcome, help me welcome my friend and colleague, Julie Roth. as I get the screen share going. Well, we are far beyond that. <laughs> that jumps to the beginning. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Close your eyes, okay. And there we are. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. When all, when, when the, the whole world would, we would solve all of this if every community had a Missy and a Jan. That's just all we need, just one Missy and one Jan everywhere, we're done. We can all just like, I don't know, what do we do in our free time? When, I don't even know. Do we, we would nap, that's what we would do. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and round this out with a deeper dive into one of the programs that has, um, elicited a lot of community interest. So I'm gonna be talking about that home energy advisor that Missy was talking about and where we are with this and why we think it's so important. Um, 
essentially the city has some ability to mandate things. They have some ability to do things on our own. We have ability to influence policy. We have ability to influence legislation, but we can't just do everything. We're not a dictatorship, although that, that could be fun, like maybe a temporary suspension of democracy, fix it all and then go back, I don't know. Anyway, barring that, we have a lot of ability to influence and educate and ease, make it easy for people to do the, the things that they wanna do and the right thing. So this is where um, the energy advisor comes in. There are so many barriers to electrification of our homes. Um, this is only four of like the, the main ones that we're bumping up against. We have contractor networks that are small um, and not always highly motivated to help people electrify gas appliances. They have supply chains that are gas, they have knowledge base, they have business models, and they're not necessarily motivated to change. We have supply chain issues, we all know this, um, with all appliances right now. The costs um, are higher as you're looking at just sort of uh, your electric equivalent sometimes to uh, another gas appliance simply because they're newer and we don't have scale and volume yet. It's complicated. Um, even, I mean, I, all of us in the, in the office are fielding calls and emails from people saying, so where do I start? Or what do you know about the ream heat pumps or water heaters, I did, things that, we are not really qualified to be answering very specific questions for people. Um, it's complicated. And familiarity, people are, are very familiar with the equipment that they've grown up with. They've been cooking on gas stoves, their parents cooked on gas stoves. They don't know, they don't have the familiarity with alternatives to be able to make those switches and feel comfortable about them. So, I'm gonna talk about the advisor service, but I'm trying to contextualize this a little bit because it's not just about the advisor service, it's about what we've done uh, to get to this point. So the first thing we tried to um, address and are still addressing is the contractor network, right? So we worked with our green bank, which is Michigan Saves, a gem in our state. They do um, low interest financing for energy efficiency upgrades that includes solar and all electrification and energy efficiency. And they, um, they have unsecured loans, so it's not attached to your mortgage, lower interest rates, and are, have a loan loss reserve. So they're able to offer credit to people who sometimes don't always qualify for credit. Anyway, they also have a um, contractor network that they work with. So we worked with them and we got a small grant from the state of Michigan to create an electrification badge program for contractors. So this is a program that contractors can take a series of videos and some tests afterwards and indicate yes that they are they are in the movement. They are interested in electrification and and they are able to help myth bust for customers and help them in their path. Um, and we rolled this out. We now have, oh, I forget how many contractors of, um, that are badged within the program now. I don't wanna say it because I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's a nice healthy mix of contractors between solar and HVAC and plumbers and energy auditors who have done the electrification badge work. So now we have at least the, a start of a contractor network that we're continuing to engage with, continuing to incentivize, continuing to relationship build with. So that was step one. Um, this is, we just hosted a contractor engagement, a big um, uh, meeting, retreat all day at um, Cobblestone that Zach helped organize, Zach did organize, uh, and we got feedback from them about the rebates that we're designing and the, um, the electrification the, or the uh, energy advisor that we're designing because we can't do this without the contractors who are in people's houses and doing this work also being engaged and feeling like they're part of the solutions, not being told what to do, right? So relationship building there. Step two, costs. You know, this is everybody, well, like, what's the cost and how do I reduce it and where am I gonna get the money to do this? So, you know, some, some recent initiatives have 
been pretty impactful here. So the IRA rebates are not coming till 2024, this is true, but there are IRA tax credits available right now for all kinds of things, like for example, a heat pump water heater, um, you used to be able to get $300 from the federal government on a tax credit that's now $2,000. Um, so we're really looking at, at amounts that can bring the costs of some of this equipment down to equivalent and sometimes even better than their gas um, cohorts. Uh, we have the climate millage where we're going to be able to stack rebates on top of what's available federally. And then we have the Michigan Saves Financing. So between the, all of these different um, buckets, uh, we can really help people f be able to access some of this equipment that otherwise would be um, kind of daunting. And step three is where we are with the Energy Advisor, reduce the complexity. Um, it, it's complicated. Even people who really want to do all of this work and live in an old building from 1920, some beautiful historic home that's drafty and charming and has no energy efficiency and all gas infrastructure, and people who really, really want to do this work don't even know where to start. Um, so that's where the energy advisor comes in. Um, the idea is that, it, so this, this program has been developed as a partnership between us and Elevate, to Elevate and Energy, and EcoWorks out of Detroit. And um, they're like a community-based organization that focuses on energy justice and community building. And so the three, organ the three of us have come together and built a model, and we've been piloting it, of it's kind of like a help desk plus, um, uh, quite a bit more. So these are the sort of services that the energy advisor will be providing. One-on-one -on -one advising support, so you're gonna call up and you're gonna say, I don't know where to start, I wanna electrify everything, or you're gonna say, um, my water heater's about to die, and I think there might be an alternative, or you're gonna say, I'm cold, my house is drafty and I'm miserable, or you're gonna say, I think I have mold issues and water issues and ventilation issues, what do I do? or I'm trying to find a heat pump and I don't know a contractor to talk to, whatever it is that you want to call that has relates to your home and its energy, um, you can call. The, and this is all going to be free, free service for all Ann Arbor residents. Um, in addition to getting help with the issue that you're calling for, you are going to leave, whether you asked for it or not, <laughs> with your individualized path to zero. So you will get help with the question that you came with about mold remediation and uh, lowering your energy bills and doing whether, whatever it is that you came with. And you will also say, and by the way, now that we have all this information about your home, we've looked at your DTE bill, we've looked at what appliances you've had, um, we can help sort of gather all that information with you. Here is a path. Here's a, what you can do over the next near term right now, midterm, three to five years, longer term at replacement of equipment so that you're prepared and you know sort of what the next maybe 10 years can look like for you so that you're not caught unaware and also so that you can plan equipment replacement, right? We need he, uh, HVAC doulas or death doulas, HVAC, HVAC, what, what is the term? It's, the, it's not doulas birth, end of life services for our HVAC because we, we can't, yeah, hospice, hospice services so that we, we have a planned transition and we're not emergency, um, you know, uh-oh, everything, my HVAC died and I need whatever I can get right now because I'm cold and it's an emergency. We want to do this more thoughtfully. This, they will help you with contractor bid reviews. So if you go out and you get multiple bids and you say, I don't understand any of this, I don't know how to compare apples to oranges and pears, you can bring them to the energy advisor. They won't choose a contractor for you, but they'll help you understand what, what you're looking at. Um, and refer you to programs, so you know if you're, if you're income qualified, you might qualify for weatherization assistance program, that kind of thing. So where, what incentives are there and um, for you. Um, the deliverable from the energy advisor is still all being worked out, we're still iterating, um, but it's gonna look at these four primary priorities and everyone's gonna have a different 
order of operations here. Some people are coming with a first priority of health and safety, others maybe environmental benefits and so forth, and so these will be ordered in, in uh, you know, respect to what an individual comes with in their own priorities. And then you're going to end up with, again, this has already changed <laughs> because we're still iterating, but you're going to end up with kind of buckets of projects within home repair, energy efficiency, electrification, renewables, et cetera, and um, also kind of um, a, uh, a to-do list <laughs> over time that can tell you, okay, short term this year, we wanna get the asbestos out of the basement and we need to do that for health and safety reasons and we also need to do that before we can do a blower door test in the house, which tests for where, where air sealing might have to happen and where your insulation isn't good. So there's a, a dependencies, right? So if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have to replace your water heater and you want to go to a heat pump and you need to maybe upgrade that outlet and you're gonna have an electrician in your house, why don't we think ahead about what else you might need? Maybe now's the time to actually think about a panel upgrade at the same time so that you're not calling that electrician out again in two years when you wanna do something else. So it's, it's this sort of path, it's this sort of preparation and planning for people. Um, the, um, the energy advisor will offer a energy assessment that's going to look kind of like um, if anyone's ever had an energy audit in their home, but much more robust than this, that looks at all of the opportunities in your house, what's going well, where are the opportunities for cost savings, for health and safety improvements, and for um, efficiency. Um, it'll look like this, it'll be very um, dense with information. And again, this is all going to be offered um, by the uh, advisor service. Um, and then there will be a series of um, information to help you connect with Michigan Saves for financing, for example, to um, access loans, rebates, tax credits, eligibility income-based uh, programs, et cetera. So that's the energy advisor service that tackles that a lot of those issues, right? Because we're also hoping that that helps us with the contractor continuing to engage the contractor community with good leads for them. So they're providing good service to us. And this is a, a cyclical thing. It's helping um, drive down costs as we are starting to see more and more of this happen in the community. Um, and then increasing familiarity. So I had to put in a plug because um, our second annual electrification, home electrification expo is coming up on August 11th at the farmer's markets, Friday night. And um, this was, we did the first one last year. It was so much fun and so successful. I think there were somewhere around 25 or so, 30 vendors there. You can come and see heat pumps and talk to solar installers and talk to energy auditors and weatherization people. You can also eat ice cream and get food from food trucks and listen to live music. And it was a lot of fun. So we're doing the second one, our second annual one, August 11th, five to nine at the farmer's market. And this is um, to the goal of continuing to increase familiarity with, with the technology and so that people can see a cooking demonstration on an induction stove, see how it works, see how quickly it boils water, you know, feel it, touch it, et cetera. So that's, um, that's that. So that, that's sort of the energy advisor service in context. So that's all I got. All right. Well, how about that? Thanks, Julie. Um, okay, well, um, thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to go into our Q&A. So um, hopefully you've been writing down your questions or if you're online, um, you are welcome to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. I see that we already have a few of them here. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, do we have any questions for those who are here in the audience? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Hi, my name is Georgia uh, Washington. I live here in Ann Arbor. I've been here since 1985. Uh, I'm a homeowner, homeowner, and I'm on a fixed income. And me and my husband both are on fixed incomes. My question is uh, financing income. 
how you going to uh, how we going to afford going electric because last time I looked nothing was free when it came to furnace electricians they all like a hundred dollars an hour or whatever for electricity we need to know that as well everything is sounds well and good but this be practical it costs money so I need to know the information where I can go get the information about what financing or what us what we can do because I don't want to have to go into debt to do any of this stuff and being that type of home I live in Ann Arbor is a great place but it also allowed a lot of weird housing to be built here in Ann Arbor <laughs> and we happen to live in one of those weird houses so I like to know you know how that's going to work if you can't do a lot of the stuff because of what your home is and then what it's made out of mm -hmm. because I think a lot of things can't be done because of the structure of the home okay. that Ann Arbor led to you know allowed to be built back in 1950s and the 1960s thank you I I can take that so yeah you mentioned the 50s and 60s I think that Zach correct me I think the first energy codes were in 77 77 yeah yeah so 1977 10 so we didn't even have an energy code until 1977, which means anything built before that was built, there was no code about how efficient your house, it was just like walls and you know, you were lucky if the contractor or builder did something more than that. And we have a lot of older housing stock for sure, so it's a valid question. Um, I would say that what we're, t there's, there's two pieces to this. There's first the efficiency measures. Right now, there's a lot of people in Ann Arbor who are spending a lot more money on their utility bills than is necessary because their houses are not efficient and they're leaking. Their heating is going out the windows and out the cracks and out, you know, through the insulation. So there is opportunity with, again, Michigan Saves Financing and some of these weatherization programs, depending on fixed income to be able to make efficiency improvements without having to fund it a lot up front but you know pace it out and then um, the, the money you're saving on your utility bills can be equivalent to sort of the payments for any of the uh, projects that you've done so those are the sorts of things that I would like the energy advisor to be able to help people understand and access. The, the baseline information that the energy advisor is gonna be giving is all gonna be free too. So at least you're gonna be able to know what the opportunities are in your house and what the opportunities are for funding because so many people are like you, I don't even know where to start. Who do I call? I don't have the money to call somebody <laughs> to come out and even assess my house. So these are the barriers we're trying to start to break down for people. And then in terms of electrification, Sure, there are going to be people who say, I am on board, I don't want gas in my house anymore, I'm electrifying everything right now, and start ripping stuff out, like, you know, some of us on this panel might be in, in that bucket of uh, people who are just, are doing things before they have to, in terms of appliance replacement. But at some point, everybody's furnace dies. So the idea is that you have a replacement plan for your furnace, because someday you're going to have to replace it, maybe, in your lifetime. and then you're gonna to have to make a choice. And the choice is, do I reinvest in fossil fuel infrastructure now, or is there a way that I can improve to an electric option that is more efficient um, and, that, and that we can subsidize with all of these rebates and loans and grants and tax incentives so that they're more equivalent in nature. So everyone's gotta replace things when they die. The idea is making the right decisions along the way and helping with that. So my hope is that the energy advisor is at hand-holding uh, service for people to meet them wherever they're at and, and start, start the process. Uh-oh, you need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> the other question I forgot to ask is what about generators because they are gas powered and not electric powered for obvious reasons i mean you know no electricity don't work so the gas power kicks on so what is going to happen with that issue because we do have 
that last four day period, yeah. a lot of people who didn't have generators had to throw out a lot of stuff and that costs money to replace. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, where things are, if you want to fix incomes, it gets to be expensive. Yeah. And if you continue to hit, hit up your insurance company, your premiums go up. So that's another expense. So I'm just wondering what is the plan for is generators in case the electricity goes out? Uh, what, what can the people do for that? Yeah, it's a good question, Georgia. Thank you for that. I, I want to go backwards to go forwards. <clears throat> I, I want to thank you for your first question because that is at the heart of a lot of what we think about in the office because our journeys are even different and our journeys are different. You know, I live in one of those 1950 quirky homes where I can't have a blower door test because we have asbestos in our HVAC. So I can't do that. And so instead we have to stack mini splits or different technologies. So the idea is not to say thou must, but to say here's what makes sense for you and here's what makes sense for you. So I I really appreciate that question because it's not the same journey, right? It just can't be. <clears throat> to your second question, what I would say is we are trying to incentivize generators that are batteries. And so what we think about here is I happen to have a battery. I also happen to have solar, but you don't have to have solar. That battery got us through the ice storm. And that battery got us through the five day outage we had a few years ago. And it works every day because I have that solar system, for me at least, so I'm paying even less because that sun, when it's overabundant and it, I'm not using as much, it's powering that battery for me. So we're trying to change the framework of how we think about uh, that backup power supply. So it's not just one option, you now have two options. And we'll figure out which one's right for you, but I would say we're looking at incentives for things like energy storage that's clean. Good question. Um, I'll simply add uh, shameless promotion for some of the previous um, uh, um, events that we've had. Um, you can watch the recordings and uh, to your question about um, uh, how to pay for some of these things, we've discussed actually in the past two uh, events, I believe, some resources. So we go a little bit more into the IRA. Uh, we talk a little bit about what's available through the city rebate. So. Um, that might be some place where you can check to. Correct. Yes. Yeah. We, we could probably send it to all registrant, like if you register with us. It's true, it's true. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of weird uh, circumstances out there. I know I was just talking to a heat pump contractor uh, just the other day who was talking about trying to come up with some clever, creative ways to get a heat pump in a home that had two furnaces and it was split to be rental at one point and then they recombined it. So um, yeah, there, there are some weird weird homes in Ann Arbor. Um, they, I think the contractors are, are becoming more and more familiar with that as we, they install heat pumps in more and more homes. So they're becoming more capable of doing that. Um, and to your question about getting your hands on some of the resources, yeah, we can, we can follow up with some email. We can also get contact information directly, but um, also for the registrants, we, we can just send it out broadly. Great. Um, I have a question um, submitted online. Um, uh, Missy, you talked a little bit about the um, carbon emissions that come from food and, and how those are calculated. You used El Harissa as an example. Uh, and this person is, is wondering if um, there is a calculator that they can use to uh, sort of guesstimate the carbon emissions of the food that they eat. And I suppose anybody can answer that. Yeah, I know that there is. It's just not top of mind. And I feel like I want to look at Stephanie and say, hey, Stephanie, you did this work with El Harissa. Can yeah. I grab the mic really quick? So how I calculated it for El Harissa yeah. was using um, this um, database called Data Field, which uh, I forget what the acronym is, it, but it's um, it was produced by researchers at the University of Michigan, 
and it's basically a massive uh, lit review of all these different food sources and what their um, life cycle emissions are from the production side and a little bit of processing for things like olive oil and that kind of thing. Um, and that's kind of listed out uh, in terms of um, kill, um, shoot, it's been a while since I <laughs> had to think about this. Uh, uh, kilograms of carbon equivalents, so thinking about methane in addition to carbon and also um, you know, other greenhouse gas emissions that have different impacts and different potency. Um, so I've kind of made my own little spreadsheet and formulas for calculating it, but it's really just um, uh, multiplying the, the mass or weight of that ingredient by whatever that carbon value is and arriving at that. And then if you're doing it for a recipe, you know, just add those up. Um, it's easier if I show it. I have slides for it. But, yeah. um. <laughs> and I would like to present our fourth surprise panelist. Oh, surprise oh. <laughs> well, I just as an alternative, that uh, probably isn't going to happen for most members of the public. No, it's that, yeah. But there are rules of thumb, though. I, I would say, like any um, ruminant animals, so things uh, animals that are have um, you know more than one stomach to digest, they produce a lot of methane. So those are cows, lamb, goat. Those are going to be your highest. Your middle. Uh, animal products in terms of greenhouse gas emissions would be um, like pork and then poultry and then fish. Um, and then, you know, if you're looking at any plant based um, protein or just any plant based, plant based ingredient, um, that's going to be very low in comparison to any animal product for the most part. Um, and most of the emissions associated with food are from its production, not so much transportation. Um, but again, it depends on the food source and you kind of have to think about it like pretty holistically, but um, those are just kind of my general rules of thumb. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I would just take this opportunity to say we are working on more educational resources in the office to help people make those kinds of decisions, like the, how you end uh, ended that remark about what sort of falls in this like red light, yellow light, green light category. And we're having really good conversations with the local food community about what sustainable food means, because it certainly can mean greenhouse gas footprint. It also could mean animal rights. It can mean workers' rights. It can mean less packaging. It can mean transportation because it's grown locally. It can mean all of those things. And sometimes those things are in conflict with each other, depending on what it is. You know, local can still be an animal protein, right? And if you're eating only plant-based, but you really like strawberries and they're out of season, that's a big transportation. So how do you how do you navigate that landscape? So that's part of the work we're doing in the community to understand what does sustainable food look like for us and how do we help create a labeling system to make it really easy for consumers to know this is the the smart sustainable food choice. Fantastic, thank you. I actually have a question. Sure. Um, so I'm buying a house right now. I close on Tuesday, but it's in Ipsy Township, not Ann Arbor. Um, what are the plans for the Home Energy Advisor program to expand beyond the city limits? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, expanding within Ann Arbor is massive for the program right now in terms of the resources we anticipate it's gonna need. The pilot, um, has been that we we're in the middle of right now. We've been piloting in 10 to 20, I think it's about 15 um, buildings in Ann Arbor. We've gotten different use cases and demographics and, and building types in there. And, and it's gonna be a pretty resource heavy. Um, there will be efficiencies realized as we roll it out and, and get volume and sort of smooth out the rough edges. However, um, it is never our goal to do something great for Ann Arbor and then go take a nap. Like that's just not that interesting. I don't think any of us are really interested in just the goal of making Ann Arbor carbon neutral in a vacuum. That's just not interesting. That's not what gets me up. So um, the goal ultimately is that we are creating something in Ann Arbor that's scalable. It won't be scalable by fall for Ipsy Township, but I also know that <laughs> that this, uh, the state, through Eagle, is looking at the, um, the IRA rebates that they're going to have to roll out, and they're looking at what we're doing with the Energy Advisor as a model, maybe for a statewide program, maybe for multiple communities to do regional adaptations of, and we anticipate to be we'll, that we'll be talking to them after the pilot is completed and we're rolling out. So. Um, probably not in your in your immediate time frame, unfortunately. But that is the goal: is is to roll these things out more broadly. Mm -hmm. I have one good idea <laughs> for you, 
before you move in, mm. there is a, a product called Aero Barrier, and um. it, it, what you can do is it does a blower door test, and it, it actually will seal, and you can, um, depending on whether you have outdoor air ventilation or whatever, but you, you can bring down the amount of air that is leaking in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, typically, you don't want to go below three unless you have uh, a, a robust kind of outside air, like an ERV in with your furnace or heat pump. Um, and you can, but then you can take it all the way down below one. So that actually is a great energy efficiency thing to do before you move in, because you have to protect everything if. You do it after. Yeah, so. you an empty building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A E R O barrier. <laughs> we are not paid by them. I just feel like <laughs> I need to give everyone a disclaimer. <laughs> right. But if I were buying a house, that's exactly what I would it do. It is a regret that I have yeah. from my home. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Thanks to all of you for your great presentations. Um, you know, one of the beauties of the 820 plan to me is that it's an action plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't just set some distant timeline and says, well, somehow we'll reach it. And um, so, uh, and it has timelines. And all of that I really appreciate. Um, th there's one I want to ask about. I think strategy two, action one, um, update building codes. Uh, if, if I remember right, it calls for the state to update its energy code in 2021 and adopt the IECC zero code appendix and that all new construction starting in 2022 be net zero and i don't think any of that has happened jan you're probably up on this um we're trying Ken. We're, trying, we're, we're trying, trying real hard but yes <laughs> yeah but in the meantime on average every month the city is approving a, a new construction sometimes quite large with gas furnaces or boilers in march uh it approved 320 gas burning apartments on Pontiac Trail, 78 gas burning townhomes um, on uh, Platte Road. And this is constantly going on. So this is undermining, I feel, a lot of the great work, um, solar rise, uh, solar on city facilities, solar on city, uh, city parks, um, poss you know, potentially the home energy advisor program. We're locking in greenhouse gas emissions and new construction for decades to come. And so what's the plan, what's plan B for this right now? Um, I'd appreciate any comment. Do you wanna do the building code or not? Right. Okay. Yeah, or was that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well uh, the, the building code is going to be going through another public hearing. Um, both the, build, I should say the energy code okay. and the, and so the goal is to go back to the, the final step in adoption. It's supposed to be ready in September. Have not heard exactly what they're doing, but there is a lot of advocacy um, to, um, on two fronts. Actually, one is to uh, make the uh, Appendix CC, which is the zero code, um, uh, either mandated or <laughs> yeah, getting a little bit of feedback here. Uh, either mandate it or uh, make it uh, give local jurisdictions the ability to mandate it. The other one is some of the legislation that's going through in the package, um, trying to um, provide dates when um, the state would have to adopt the, the zero code. And we'll see how that evolves. So there are kind of two avenues of advocacy right now. Before I go on, Zach, did you want to add anything? Uh, code? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so can I really appreciate, you know, one of the things I love about A202 is that we have these timelines and we have these metrics that we can track towards. And I love that it's living because it has to be. And this is one of those case in points where Local governments are creatures of the state, and in this case, we are pushing hard on this action. It's just the timeline's out of our control. Good news on code, because it's opened up for public comment, though, that means you can comment. 
right, if you missed a chance to push more aggressively because you know who is? Home builders and others. So we need to get activated and show up and demand an aggressive code that protects public health and safety, right? So we have another chance. That's, that's good, it's not great that it's not done yet, but we'll send that out through our newsletter when we know when the public hearings are. So please do sign up if you'd like to participate. The other piece I would say is the living part of the plan means we can't just put all of our eggs in one action. We actually have redundancies in the office that we work on. So one of the things that is not in A20, but that we're working on is the sustainable heating franchise. So I'm not gonna take for granted that it's enough that we just say no new. What if we actually talk about declining sales of gas for everybody? What if we talk about achieving that through deep efficiency, focusing on low-income households so their bills decrease? What if we think about our system fundamentally different? So in some ways, I'm really disappointed that the state has moved so slow, and in other ways, it has forced us to look at other options that might actually take us further faster. So I would say, uh, if you have suggestions, we wanna hear them too. We do have to work within the realities of being creatures of the state and the legal context in which we operate. So it is not, one example I will give, it is not uncommon, uh, it tends to be youth from the University of Michigan who come into our office and say, adopt this building code. And we say, that's nice, that's illegal because it is in Michigan. We cannot adopt a more aggressive building code until we set up a framework that allows us to do that through legislation or through an adoption of a code that makes that explicit. So we're sort of forced to be creative. It is one of my favorite things about the office and one of the things that I hate a lot because I would really like this to be easy. So, sorry. Remember the part about the temporary suspension of democracy? <laughs> I feel like that's all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Julie. That feels that's like a slippery slope the takeaway slope from this session. <laughs> However, I, I'm a planning commission uh, chair uh, in SIO <laughs> and I have to say every development that comes before us uh, and I'm trying to put this into an, a, a narrative requirement is, okay, we've adopted a resolution for community carbon neutrality by 2035. We're in alignment with the um, county. Um, how is this development going to meet that goal? And we have been, you know, with a, a planned unit development, you have um, more, um, more, there's more negotiation, but we have had um, actually some success in getting commitments from um, the builders and the, um, and the developers to um, go all electric. We pushed a little bit. We have one that just got approved that's doing a one megawatt of solar farm with the development. So um, yeah, it's not, everything, but it is getting people to change. The other piece is how do you, how do you affect the market? But people are buying these houses that have gas, okay? How do we affect the market? What if, what if, they were, what if people said, I'm not gonna buy a house that has gas appliances? And, and I think that, that will move the home builders much faster. Mm -hmm. And, and so how do we get that, you know, really talk about that awareness of where are you gonna put your investment? Um, if I were to add anything to that, I, I think first I would say congratulations on knowing the plan so well that you can call out action one of <laughs> strategy two. You are probably the first, um, if not, you're one of the first at least, if not the first resident who I know that has called that out. So that's awesome. Thank you. That means a lot to, to, to me anyway, that, that you're that familiar with it. Um, and then um, to, to the question of like, what's the plan B? Um, I'll just say that from my vantage point, there isn't really a plan B. We're focusing on plan A, which is to decarbonize and um, electrify everything. It is just to underscore some of the things that has been said, it's a big, Beast. This ship is moving. It takes a lot to, to change course. Um, but we are working on that at the state level. Uh, in fact, just th this week and last week, Jan and I were uh, e emailing about a uh, Senate bill that's going forth and trying to figure out how that might we might be able to um, use that to our advantage to help move along some of these. Um, and, and, and Jan's right. We are actually seeing far more um, developments come through that in the plan review process, um, they are being encouraged to 
uh, seek out all electric alternatives. And I've seen at least a couple um, developments where they had gas proposed and removed gas from their site plans as, a, as um, part of this, this plan review process. So um, it's, it's slow going, but we're working on it really hard. It is absolutely what we want to see. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, is there another question here? Great. Um, so I moved in right before the pandemic, uh, February 2020. So I feel like I'm brand new to Ann Arbor still. <laughs> but uh, s some ways yes, some ways no. What I'm, I'm s trying to make a decision whether I stay in Ann Arbor or return to where I came from, which is New England, uh, back to Massachusetts. But if I stayed and, and I want to be a homeowner because I've rented, uh, I would have to, uh, I have till 20, 2035. I thought it was a 10 year plan, but now it's 15. I, I, I think when this came out and I was attending some of where this was being talked about or, re or being presented, it was kind of in the neighborhoods and whatnot. I think it was on a 10-year plan, but maybe um, that's it's what it was discussed, and now it's 15. 15 is nope. the county. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, for Washtenaw. Um, yeah. But I think if I'm, the, if I'm sort of on the outside looking in and looking at your housing market, you do have certain amount to rent. Um, and then right now, I find it very hard to find something to buy. And then you're asking us, yes, we want to be all in. And we're very pro-green. Um, but, uh, but at the end of the day, we still need a place to live immediately. <laughs> so, um, so how do we help that issue? And the other question I want to ask is, how is this all paid for? Is that going to be that in the next we're in 2023, and you're going to 2035. Are you going to be coming back to all the residents in Ann Arbor and saying, ante up, we need more? Because the advisors aren't free. I'm, I, I'm just not seeing the dollars and cents. I've tried to ask people questions about that where A20 has been in the public. Um, and. I haven't quite gotten that answer, but uh, sure. So it's there, sort of twofold. <laughs> um, so Missy did discuss a little bit yeah. in. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. okay. That's fine. Um, uh, no worries. In uh, in in Missy's presentation, she just did discuss a little bit um, about both the millage that passed in last November that will be generating close to $7 million annually through property taxes to fund some of these things like Julie's um, Energy Advisor Program. And the, uh, we are aggressively pursuing a lot of um, funding out from outside of the city as well. Um, Julie, you looked like you were gonna say something, or Missy, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, uh, one, I would say our plan is 2030. It's 2035 is the county, the city of Ann Arbor is 2030, and there is no assumption that every household and every business is carbon neutral by 2030. Oh. Like, if, if, you, if, you've, um, if, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk to you about the plan. The idea is that we're doing as much as we can locally, and we continue to build momentum to help every household eventually get there. We're gonna have to use different techniques and approaches. And um, I will share m my preference, and a lot of this work is changing the system. What happens if you just get electricity and that electricity is green and you don't have to do anything? What happens if you get heat and that heat is affordable and green and you don't have to do anything? If we can find solutions like that, we knocked 80% of our emissions down in two actions. Right? So a lot of what we think about, certainly we've spent a lot of time today talking about individual behavior change, but a lot of my time in the office is focused on big systems change to help us hit our goals and objectives. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or helps at all. It, you won't even have to do anything. It's done for you. 
Yeah, and that doesn't mean people can't invest in solar and battery storage and other systems because we still need that to take place. But how do we take the big chunks? Because otherwise, what we're asking is 120,000 people to row in the same direction. That would be nice, but that's not realistic in the time that we have. So we're going to continue to build the movement. It snowballs. You see success here. Your neighbors start doing it. We saw it in Solarize. Things take off. That, that's human behavior change. We know that. We continue to embrace initiatives like that. And the systems in which we operate are broken. So we have to change the systems. It is not your fault that your electricity is dirty. You didn't do that. So let's fix it. Right? That's how we, we tend to think about the system. No, the voters. <clears throat> yeah, so our office, the Office of Sustainability and Innovations is the caretakers for A20. Our office is funded through a combination of general fund, just like normal kind of operations within the city. And then starting July 1, we will, uh, the voters passed in November a 20 year climate millage that will generate $7 million uh, for the office. So that'll help. Uh, uh, $7 million a year. Yeah, yep. And that'll go into the office and then we fundraise. So this year alone, we've already brought in over 5 million for the work in the office and we continue to do that, kind of leveraging the other dollars that we have. Federal government, state government, uh, philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, both. Yeah, both. Uh, so we have some philanthropic dollars that come in, the grant makers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I'll be working on one tonight. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> that's very kind. Well, fingers crossed, y'all. We put in a $79 million one two weeks ago. So, <laughs> yeah. That's great. 79. 79 million. Yeah. So uh, we have just a few minutes here. I've got a couple questions that were online that I want to make sure that we can um, represent as well. Um, sort of building off of the scalability of A20 and for expanding to other communities um, and, and sort of to Stephanie's question about what if you live just outside of Ann Arbor, what are some of the resources that you have access to? Um, Jan, I'm wondering if you um, might have any insight into things like the commercial solar program or benchmarking and how um, businesses or um, folks outside of Ann Arbor can participate with those? Is that available to them? Um, and, and where can they start? Yeah, so yeah, actually, um, even though it's called the Ann Arbor 2030 district, uh, any of our programs are available to anyone in Washtenaw County um, and the, uh, it, we are starting to slowly do outreach. Right now, we prefer people who are in, just because the benchmarking, we have a pilot with DTE that allows the data to come in automatically. Um, it, it's preferable that you're in the DTE ter territory because consumers doesn't have an automatic data input. So we're working on, um, they, they are, I think it's Kalamazoo that they're working on one. Mm -hmm. But it, that, the flow of data is so important to benchmark, and what's what's really neat is um, this month we're June first, right? Tomorrow, Tomorrow. we we close it down. We have the people that have already benchmarked, and it'll be very interesting. I'm waiting to see, I, I, and we're one of the networks that. Um, many of the 2030 districts are in the core of a city, and many of those buildings in uh, the cores of a lot of those cities are relatively new, or they have very sophisticated energy management systems. Our district is, is really open to um, all buildings. We have a lot of very, we have a lot of buildings that have lots of energy efficiency opportunities, so it's gonna be very interesting to see it, um, when we aggregate all the data where the buildings are and then see um, uh, see which buildings have done things that have actually reduced their greenhouse gas emissions and their um, energy. And so we're, this is the first year we're actually gonna award people for making progress. <laughs> so it, uh, I think that'll be really fun. But it is, that, that's going over, but it is available to anyone in, in Washtenaw County. 
we will make it happen. Great. Um, well, there's there's one remaining question, um, and maybe we can do it real quickly. Um, this one is um, Julie or Missy. Do you know if the city collects any? data or statistics around the circular economy? How much waste is generated by businesses and households and where can we find that information? Yeah, we do track tonnage for uh, waste and recycling and that's available on the city's website. We also have a circular economy map where you can find businesses that are engaging in the circular economy. And uh, the answer to the second part is no, but uh, we did just do a study with University of Michigan students and we identified three metrics, three categories of metrics, and we're gonna be building those metrics out to start tracking more work around uh, circularity in the community. So we have the base, kind of tonnage and diversion rates, uh, but we wanna go much deeper. So we can start there today. That's great, that's great, cool. Um, well, um, I think on that note, we will say thanks to our panelists so much for joining us. Um, and thank you all for coming out. I see a couple of familiar faces, so I know that some of you have been to these before, so it's great to see you out here again. And thanks to everybody online uh, for joining Tyler and Tyler at AADL and Emily and all of the staff that have helped pull these off over the last few months. Thank you all so much. Yes. Let's give a round of applause. Um, and I will do one final plug for A20 Week. It's a2gov.com org slash a20 week and you can find all of the events that we're doing um, we are looking for volunteers for some events speaking of circular economy we're helping the dexter ann arbor run be um net zero waste uh so they are off um uh sorting out all of the the waste and making sure that everything is either reused or recycled um so you can find out information about that and as well as all of the other events online um, we hope to see you soon at some 820 Week events. Thanks for coming out.